Hello all, thank you for joining to our day two diversity and inclusion session. This session is going to be on the importance of diversity and inclusion for algorithmic bias condition, uh, considerations. And we have with us Dr. Ansgar Kion, who is, who is um, the IEEE P7003 ethics, uh, who is the, I'm sorry, who is uh, the IEEE 7003 uh, Standards Framework uh, ethic Chair and also the Global AI Ethics and Regulatory Leader at uh, Ernst & Young. Over to you, Ansgar. Okay, thank you very much, Sukanya, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this conference. It's great to be able to speak at a conference that um, is reaching out to a wider audience that um, is often not really included in a lot of the discussions around AI ethics. Uh, one of the items that I will be uh, touching on in my talk is the problem of where these conversations are actually taking place and the lack of inclusivity, um, inclusion in the actual process of thinking around AI ethics and um, the related standards development. So, um, so my talk today is going to focus on uh, algorithmic bias considerations as one particular uh, case of a standard for this. But before getting to that, um, I'd like to start with a general introduction a bit about the issues around algorithmic bias or um, lack of diversity and inclusion in the AI and technology development in general and provide a bit of a context also as to the types of developments that are happening in the regulatory space related to this. So um, as I'm sure you're all aware, algorithmic discrimination is an issue that's uh, being discussed increasingly. It's uh, frequently a topic in the news due to um, the increasing use of AI systems for applications that have real world implications such as um, uh, sorting of uh, job applicants, um, doing face recognition as part of uh, policing or those kinds of activities, um, use in uh, credit assessments and various types of other applications. So with the movement of AI out of the sphere of games such as Go and chess into real world applications, the uh, necessity to make sure that the systems are not biased, as in uh, the decisions are appropriate to the kinds of stakeholders that are being impacted and are taking into account the relevant kinds of data um, has become increasingly important. So typical causes of uh, bias are related to a lack of inclusiveness in the kinds of data sets that are being used, but also in the kind of people that are working on these, which are ultimately the ones that are deciding uh, what kind of issues need to be considered. So this is just a, a brief overview of some of those um, cases. And on the top left, you'll see Joy Bulwimi, uh, who made a lot of uh, headlines when she talked about the, the, the big um, failures of uh, face recognition algorithms, for instance, to even see the, the presence of a black face uh, and then subsequent uh, issues with their performance. So this is uh, just one of the studies that uh, Toy Bulwimi and her colleague Timnit uh, Begru did, the gender shade study. This um, was basically looking at the types of databases that are being used when building face recognition algorithms. So on the uh, left, you see uh, three of these, the uh, ADIANS, the IGBA, and a special one that they created, uh, uh, the PBB one. Um, and what it indicates in, in colors on those bars is the distribution of um, dark and light um, faces and also um, the intersectionality of dark male and dark female versus uh, light male and light female kinds of faces in the training data sets. And what you can clearly see is that the traditional training data sets, the audience IGBA, which are used by the industry leaders, um, 
are heavily skewed in the kinds of data that um, they have. And as a result, their performance is also heavily skewed. Um, and so what they did in the study is they introduced an alternative data set that is balanced across these. And importantly, what they showed is that um, when companies actually made an effort to use this more balanced kind of data set and they generated better performance for the minority population, actually what they got was also a better performance for everybody, including a performance on the majority population, which makes intuitive sense because effectively by making sure that you're introducing a more diverse kind of data set of all types of faces that um, a system might encounter, you are actually pushing the system to more clearly um, work on those features in the image that are truly relevant to face uh, distinction. Uh, a different case that attracted a lot of attention was the um, case around the Compass system. So Compass is a system that is used in the criminal justice um, uh, process in the US to do assessments around whether or not a, um, a person who's been arrested should be uh, able to get bail, um, pre-trial bail, or also uh, in assessments of whether somebody should be up for parole. And the system has been introduced quite broadly in, in, in a fair number of states. The manufacturer of the system uh, has claimed that their system is not racially biased. They've made um, a lot of efforts to make sure that the accuracy of the system, which is shown um, on the left in the blue box, is uh, well balanced across both, both white and black defendants and is equally kind of balanced as human performance would be. However, the um, ProPublica uh, journalists did a deeper analysis into the way in which the system is performing, not in the cases where it is performing accurately, or not even just looking at how often does it make an accurate judgment or an incorrect judgment for someone, but it, they look more deeply into what kind of errors does the system actually make when it makes an error. And while then looking at that, so looking at the false positives and false negative rates, they identified that the types of errors that the system makes for black defendants or for white defendants are significantly different. So for black defendants, it would when it makes an error, it would make an error of judging the defendant to be more likely to be a, a serial offender and therefore not, um, not eligible for bail. Uh, whereas in the case of a white defendant, it would tend towards errors of a, assuming that the defendant is uh, not a serious criminal. And this was an important a uh, piece of discussion that started in, in, in 2016, because it uh, further looking into this, especially the fact that the manufacturers could claim that the system was not biased, whereas the journalists were saying it is biased. How could you know, a system be both biased and not biased at the same time? Deeper looking into this more deeply raises the issues that there are multiple ways in which a system can be fair or not fair, can be biased or not biased. And the problem that unless you have very specific conditions in the underlying data, generally speaking, it will be impossible for the system to be fair across all different types of measures, highlighting that uh, there needs to be a clear discussion as to which of these judgments, which error metric is the most appropriate one to use in a particular kind of use context. Now, it's important to just reflect back a bit uh, on the fact that issues around um, bias due to failure of diversity in the uh, testing population, in the population developing the system, um, et cetera, failures of uh, diversity if for technology are not new. They are not purely related to AI kinds of systems. So a classic one being um, the photo calibration issue with uh, photographic film back in the 1960s and 70s, uh, when Kodak being a, a major film developer at that time um, was calibrating their film in order to get the best um, uh, quality of image. They did so based on 
the majority population in the US being white faces. So the film is calibrated to best reflect um, images of uh, white faces. And as a result, it doesn't actually perform well on uh, darker skin, cones, skin, skin tones. And this has led to quite a lot of um, uh, issues around basically intrinsic discrimination within that kind of a technology. And to a large extent has even translated into the digital era because of simply reusing the same kind of um, color palettes, uh, even though that is no longer uh, technically uh, an argument for having this kind of an issue um, with the use of digital technologies. So, um, a different case was, uh, which was actually a, a recent one um, that attracted various attention was the use of uh, photo sensors to um, trigger soap dispensers. And um, the people having noticed that these uh, systems don't actually work with dark skin, at least the initial set that was produced. Um, and again, this is a, a stupid kind of oversight. Basically, the people who developed the system, when they tested it, does it work? They never bothered to test it with people with uh, darker skin tones. And again, there's no AI involved in this. This is simply a case of having a photo detector and calibrating at which level it should be triggered. But it, what it indicates is sort of a intrinsic problem of not having a diverse enough set of people involved in the development that these kinds of things uh, just didn't occur to the people who were working on this. Um, and finally, as in just one more example, I'm not saying that this has been an exhaustive list. Um, final example, just something to highlight that the issues of diversity um, are not purely questions about things like race or gender, um, but for instance, a, a huge area of concern when it comes to the internet is actually diversity with relation to age or uh, mental capacity in that um, internet services, generally speaking, do not test or we ask for what is your age or, or what is your mental capacity when you in engage with them. They treat everybody sort of equally. But what that means is they treat everybody as if everybody is an adult, as if everybody is effectively a, a middle class Western kind of person. Um, and so this has led to concerns. Organizations such as the Five Rights Foundation, which is uh, working for the rights of young people online, and uh, the UN um, are working on trying to highlight some um, this issue and trying to promote that technology companies, internet service uh, providers uh, should address this issue. So the um, UN Charter on the Rights of Children uh, is currently being uh, reviewed to uh, create an, a new general comment. So general comments on the UN Charters is basically a way of describing how to interpret the charter in relation to something. So this is a general charter of uh, general comment on the UNCRC regarding uh, children's rights in relation to the digital environment, which is um, highlighting these types of issues of the in digital environment, basically assuming that everybody is adult. So after having slightly reflected on the fact that um, these issues of arising from lack of diversity in, in the developer community um, are not purely related to AI kinds of systems, let's reflect a bit on why is it that with the introduction of AI kinds of systems, this has become such an issue uh, in the news and also something that has so attracted so much more attention from regulators. And in a sense, uh, one way to distill this down is um, what I'm sort of pointing at here, which is that AI systems, um, the way in which they're currently being applied for automated decision making, have a tendency to effectively reduce complex individuals down to a simplistic 
binary stereotypes. So what do I mean with that? So um, this is just a um, sort of exaggerated, I mean, it's a real example, but it has in, in the sort of extreme part of the, of the spectrum of, of application spaces. Um, was this paper that um, uh, came out uh, back in 2017 um, by two academics from a business school who were using an AI system, a machine learning system, uh, trained on faces from uh, dating websites um, and to try and see whether there is something in the facial features themselves, so the, the physiology of, of the facial features, that would indicate whether somebody is um, heterosexual or homosexual. Um, and so this is sort of a, a, a textbook example of where multiple sources of problems can arise. So the first point is just the way in which the problem was phrased. Um, even if we were to say that it is valid to start to look at whether physiology um, has an indication towards sexual orientation, the way in which the, pro the, the project was framed, it immediately indicate, assumed um, that you, a binary, that you can only be homosexual or, or heterosexual, that there can be nothing in between. Whereas um, sociology tells us that um, this, is, uh, this is basically not the accepted um, scientific understanding, rather sexuality is on, on a spectrum. So anything, anyone who's bisexual would not be classified properly in this. Uh, then there's the question about the kinds of data sets that they were using, accessing data from a dating site without getting consent, assuming all kinds of things about the types of responses that people gave in the data set, and then basically just using those, this kind of a, a still relatively small data set, um, to establish some kind of a stereotype of what a person is and you know, how that would relate to sexual orientation. So basically, one of the issues is a lot of the machine learning systems that are based, that are being used to uh, ingest large data sets of, of um, various populations and try to um, distill those down to certain categories, groups, and make predictions based on that. In, a se in effect, what they're doing is uh, what we would classically call stereotyping. They're saying you are of this type, therefore you will have this kind of behavior without directly engaging uh, with the person. And so this kind of effectively what the technology is being used for is one of the triggers for why this has become such a sensitive area and has directed so, so much um, regulatory concern. Now, um, Diversity, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that uh, often one of the reasons why these issues actually come into the development process and, act and even end up in the final product is simply because the development team is insufficiently diverse. You know, if you don't have somebody on the team who is of this minority group, then you're much likely to not notice that you've made an assumption about how people are uh, that does not apply beyond this bubble of, of people who are in the group. And so this is just um, some statistics uh, that came out earlier this year um, in June uh, regarding how is the, are the big tech companies, basically the Silicon Valley kind of companies, um, how are they performing when it comes to employing a more diverse uh, workforce? Um, and so what it shows is that um, the percentage of black workers in, back, in, in big tech in, in the US um, is roughly sort of around the 3.5%. Um, and it hasn't really improved much over the years. Apple is doing somewhat better at a sort of 8, 8.5%. However, if we compare that to the US census, um, Black and African Americans are 13.4% of the population, uh, and then Hispanics um, are another 15.3%. And in the Black workers, they might have included Hispanics, it's not exactly clear. Uh, but so even if we're just assuming only the, 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 the segment in that in the census is listed as 
Black or African American, the Black workers in the tech is about half uh, it half as much or, or one third as much as it should be to just even be um, on par with uh, the, the demographics of the US. Um, and it is debatable whether being on par on par with the de with the democrat demographics is actually the thing that you should be aiming for, um, because even if the population is much smaller than that, um, let's say the Native Americans, which um, uh, in this census are just one point three percent, that would not you would still want to have some representatives who can at least think about the types of issues that this kind of population might have, because you will still be impacting them. So who's been thinking about these kinds of issues? So the, as I've mentioned, these kinds of problems around uh, bias and discriminatory issues with AI have uh, attracted quite a bit of media attention. A lot of the slides that I showed had um, uh, snippets from, from newspapers. Uh, so as a result of that, we've had a huge proliferation of AI principles, ethics principles coming out. Um, this has been sort of the first response to it. A lot of governments um, have been having parliamentary inquiries, et cetera, to try to figure out you know, where does the problem exactly lie. They, are, they don't want to move immediately towards something like regulation because there is concern that um, uh, moving too fast with regulation would interfere with innovation and that would um, cause sort of uh, reduce the ability to compete with neighboring countries. Um, and so the, the focus currently has been on AI principles. And so here we've seen just some of these, like the European Commission's had a high level expert group working on principles. One of the earliest ones was from more of a academic space, the Asilomar AI principles. A lot of uh, big tech companies have come out with their own set of principles. The IEEE did um, Ethically Aligned Design, which is a, um, a, a book that goes into a, a bit more depth, but it's effectively also a discussion around what are the principles, the ethics, the ethical concerns to, to think about. Um, and the OECD came out with a set of um, principles, which is particularly important because the, this is the set of principles that were subsequently adopted by the G20 and have effectively become more or less the standard that most countries are looking to as the basis for um, national AI strategies, uh, national sort of reflections on AI principles and potentially going forward the basis for AI regulation. Now, the Berkman Klein Institute um, has done a very nice um, analysis of the various different um, AI principles that have come out um, over the last couple of years. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but uh, basically what the graph shows is that uh, the majority of principles um, overlap quite heavily on the types of themes that are being reflected in them. Largely, they reflect the same kinds of ethical principles that we also find in things like medical ethics, um, which to a large extent is good because it means uh, we have a certain general human uh, agreement on these. And to a large extent, they do um, follow also principles from um, the uh, fundamental human rights. Now, um, AI, as I said, is increasingly at the top of the agenda of most governments of developing nations. So this map just shows in yellow uh, various countries that have in recent times uh, published either um, AI principles, national AI strategies, or related kinds of works indicating that these governments are thinking about whether or not to start introducing regulation. Um, in, effect, in effect, we're seeing a kind of parallel AI race and we've got the AI technology development race that is sort of led by US and China, uh, but we have also an AI regulation race uh, where Europe seems to be sort of the, the front runner at the moment. Um, but what we see importantly also, if we look at this map and uh, which areas are yellow, is that the majority of this is um, the 
global north, so to speak. It's uh, North America, Europe, um, and Australia in this context is often, often folded into sort of um, the Europe kind of category, um, plus China. Um, and China being uh, a uh, important mover in this kind of space. Um, so the major policy bodies that are working on AI are, as I mentioned, the European Commission and uh, the, the white paper on artificial intelligence is, is an important one, um, that, that the paper that came out in February and is currently being, um, the, the feedback on that is currently being processed. Uh, this is an important one because it is the first um, policy paper that has really talked about specifics around how AI might end up being regulated by a uh, large regulatory body like the European Commission. Um, the Chinese government has published its uh, principles around AI governance, uh, which are uh, largely in line with um, what the o uh, OECD's AI principles were. Um, and they are moving quite fast also to try to establish sort of a, a reference point that the rest of the world might anchor their regulation against. Council of Europe is uh, doing a lot of work as well as the OECD, as I mentioned, and the OECD's work became reflected in the G20. Now, importantly, if we think about all of these uh, policy bodies, again, they are severely dominated by um, the, the Western way of thinking, um, by the Global North. OECD um, is basically a Global North kind of organization. It's um, Europe, North America, Japan, more or less. Um, it has some observer states. India is an observer state. Um, the UNESCO is working on something to give it more of a truly global perspective that would include Global South. Um, however, the UNESCO work is not being heavily referred to currently in the discussions. This might change, but at this moment, uh, the main reference point for a lot of governments is, is the OECD work. So there we have a lack of diversity when it comes to the actual thinking around AI regulation. So what does AI regulation, how do governance, governance frameworks, um, you know, at a high level, how do they sort of, could you categorize them? So roughly speaking, um, we can think of uh, six different ways in which government um, can respond to issues around things like bias or censorship, um, social discrimination, those kinds of things, which is um, on the left, we have two types of market solutions, which is basically demand side or supply side. This is a free market kind of uh, developments, let the market sort itself out. If you are providing a product that um, is highly discriminatory um, and people have an alternative product that they could turn to, the idea is that people would um, select the, uh, the less discriminatory one and market forces would lead to an improvement of the systems. In practice, we've seen that this is problematic the uh, nature of a lot of this technology that is uses has a strong network effects that capture the market has made it very difficult to establish this type of actual um, competition that would lead to improvement in, in, in the products. Then we have in the middle company self-organization and branch self-organization. So this is basically uh, companies doing internal governance saying uh, we're going to do um, internal oversight and regulations uh, in order to effectively avoid having to get um, state intervention. So state intervention is the, is the strong law kind of approach where government will say you are allowed, you're not allowed to do this and that, uh, will set clear um, requirements. Uh, for instance, the potential that you might need to get a prior certification before being allowed to deploy your product. And co-regulation is sort of in between, it is where you have um, government indicating the types of um, issues that need to be done, but industry developing sort of the details of that 
government doing an oversight over it. Now, industry standards basically lie in this branch self-regulation, somewhat in the co-regulation space, when states decide that they're going to refer to certain standards as part of regulatory requirements. But generally speaking, industry standards are part of this self-regulation, often referred to as soft law um, kind of space of, of working. So um, this is a, a just a, a kind of an overview of how um, various standards operate relative to each other, so sort of from the national level to, in this case, I've had, I have the European level here, and then the international level. And what you can see is uh, my personal bias in this, that because I am based in, in Europe, uh, a lot of my work reflects the way of operating in Europe. Um, and so what we see at the bottom is uh, every country basically has its own national standards bodies, and they can develop na nation-specific types of standards for things. And you will find this in, in things such as um, the shape of your plugs and your sockets for um, appliances to um, safety standards around things um, to uh, to do to other kinds of standards. Um, then on top of that, you can have uh, regional standards bodies. So in the case of Europe, you have Sen and Senelec. Um, this might not be the case in some, uh, for instance, uh, in North America, there isn't really a regional one. Um, and then on top of that, you have the international one. So this is organizations such like ISO, IEC, IEEE, also the ITU are relevant standards bodies when it comes to things like AI related standards development. And at this moment, what we see is that there is a focus from the national standards bodies um, to really uh, pool their work and focus on developing standards at the international level. So a lot of the national standards body work is being focused on developing ISO IEC standards. So ISO IEC currently has uh, a number of working groups that are developing uh, quite a range of standards related to AI and that um, a lot of these are focusing on technical aspects, including um, the basic one of terminology, making sure that when you say AI or uh, machine learning that we all agree as to what that means. Um, but also things like uh, robustness, uh, governance frameworks, um, and the uh, working group three within the ISO IEC JTC1 SE42 to, to, to give it the full, um, full title. Um, the working group three within that is focused on trustworthiness issues. So that includes uh, questions such as um, bias and societal impa impacts. IEEE is um, working sort of, in, in a sense, it's a bit parallel to the system in that uh, national standards bodies um, aren't directly re reflected in uh, IEEE work. IEEE participation is mostly either directly through individuals or th sometimes um, through um, uh, companies, uh, depending on what particular type of IEEE standard it is. But IEEE uh, launched a whole um, series of standards focusing on AI ethics, the P7000 series, um, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute or so. So um, just to highlight a couple of the standards developments that are currently ongoing that are specifically dealing with diversity and inclusion type of issues. So within the IEEE P7000 series, we have the P7000 itself, uh, the uh, model process for addressing ethical concerns during system design. So this is a standard that is focusing on really how can you introduce considerations around ethics into a system design process? How do you integrate within the, the, the flow of the development of an AI system, uh, the stage of reflection around um, ethical concerns? 7003 is the algorithmic bias um, considerations uh, working group. And I'll talk about that in, in more detail. 7010, which is 
uh, the only one that of these that has already been published um, is focused on recommended practice for assessing the impact of autonomous intelligence systems for human well-being. So this is trying to uh, provide some guidance around how to think about how an AI system uh, might impact human well-being in, in the more broader sense. And this one is included here specifically because the development, the, the working group for this uh, made an, a, con a, a specific effort to include also other um, philosophical perspectives beyond the uh, Western Christian kind of one that is often implicitly dominated uh, within these kind of uh, standards developments because participants in these standards working groups are frequently uh, primarily from, um, from the West. Um, so they, they made sure to include also uh, Shinto and Ubuntu and um, uh, and and various other um, philosophies as an under, as a as a basis of thinking about ethical or, or impact on human well-being. And so, and within the ISO IEC, as I mentioned, uh, there's the trustworthiness uh, working group, and uh, most specifically, there's the bias in AI systems and AI aided decision making. A standard um, that has come out. Um, and so this is also um, a strong contributor to in, in the kind of space around thinking on diversity and inclusion. So uh, IEEE, um, it, its slogan is advancing technology for humanity, which is what drove IEEE to think about the need to really uh, introduce uh, work specifically reflecting on ethics of AI kind of systems. Um, and in the card below, you see it's sort of the, the um, official um, designation around the P7003 standard. So the global, um, so this this work around AI ethics is basically, it's part of what's called the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous Intelligent Systems. Uh, it currently has 14 standards under development. It was a bit too much for me to list them all here. Um, and uh, and also part of this global initiative is the ethically aligned design work. Um, there's also some work happening on uh, certification uh, regarding um, ethical uh, ethics certification for for um, AI systems, and some work uh, going on around um, education. So within so so I'm I'm, I'm now switching. Uh, to thinking about specifically the the 7003 algorithmic bias consideration standard. So an important sort of starting point within our way of thinking is that algorithmic systems are socio-technical. It's important to keep in mind that even though we are building a technical system, uh, a, a machine, uh, ultimately uh, it is being built by people within an organization and they all live within a society that has political, legal and cultural context. And all of these things are inherently taken with us when we engage with our work uh, and shape the way in which our decision making um, happens. And so these things need to be considered, especially to when um, thinking about the types of stakeholders that are going to be impacted and whether or not uh, we have properly um, recognized their perspectives. So algorithmic bias considerations, uh, what do we mean actually with bias? So effectively what we mean is minimizing uh, bias that is unintended, unjustified, and un unacceptable. Um, this is this statement just because uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, bias is basically a the fact that the outcome is is not random and not uh, uniformly distributed um, and often in a sense bias is the thing that you're trying to achieve but um, the point is whether or not uh, you are directing the outcomes in a way that is justified and intended. So key causes of algorithmic bias tend to be rooted in insufficient understanding of the context of use. And so this 
includes of understanding who it is that will actually be impacted by the system. Who is the, um, the audience, the, 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 um, are the users who will be um, having to use the system or be, will be impacted? Uh, a clear example of this type of failure to understand context has been issues like uh, social media um, content filtering that hasn't understood different languages, hasn't understood different cultural um, sensitivities, and therefore has been basically applying a uniform uh, US-centric percept perception on what is uh, appropriate content um, uh, leading to various problems in, in different countries. Uh, another one is failure to rigorously map decision criteria. So what do I mean with that? So this is basically during the development, a lot of decisions are being made and some of these decisions may be um, un unconscious decisions. They're decisions, for instance, of um, not including the fact that you needed to think about a type of uh, exception condition. There are uh, assumptions that are being made about how the system is going to be used, um, which may not reflect the way in which it will ultimately be used because other people are approaching it from a different kind of perspective. And then finally, failure to explicitly to have explicit justifications for the chosen criteria. So this explicit justifications is something that we focus on because this is really a, a way of making sure that you have that rigorous decision making. And it is also an important element of communicating the ways the decisions were being made and making sure that you have uh, a justification. Uh, so a way of explaining why you chose one type of fairness over another type. Why did you choose um, fairness of process? treating everybody in the same way, as opposed to fairness of outcome, making sure that everybody gets an equal type of an outcome, for instance. Uh, this is just a, a quick overview of the type of elements that are going into this kind of standard. And I just want to highlight um, that we include specifically uh, an informative section of thinking about cultural aspects. How do different cultural um, backgrounds have an input on uh, the way in which the system might be used, the way in which outcomes might be perceived and um, uh, experienced, um, the way in which the cultural background of the people involved in the development might influence and might bias the, 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 the system's uh, performance. Stakeholder identification, very important. If you don't really understand who the stakeholders are, who the people are who are going to be impacted by it, uh, you will not be able to properly make sure that you have uh, things like a representative data set uh, for these. Risk and impact assessment supporting this kind of work. Um, representative data assurance. Uh, clearly, um, a lot of the discussion around issues with bias in, in AI systems has focused on bias in the data sets. And so an evaluation of that needs to be part of any uh, re work to make sure that you've um, considered the bias issues in your in your system. And system evaluation, you know, are the outcomes biased? Um, tests against that. Key questions that effectively come out will be is that need to be asked or who will be affected? What are the decision optimization criteria that you've actually implemented into your system? How are these criteria justified? Are these justifications acceptable in the context where the system is used? And so I've hinted at this already. One of the problems if with the whole space of work that is currently happening around AI, um, AI ethics is a lack of diversity in the community that is actually working in this space. If you uh, access this uh, map by Berkman Client Center, for instance, on, on their website, and you zoom in on it, you will find that um, along the circle, uh, on the outside of the circle, where the different um, sources of, of principles are, are listed here, you will find predominantly European countries and uh, or principles coming from the, the United States. There's the occasional uh, South American national AI strategy, 
but as far as ethical key um, principles work that has been published, they are predominantly um, European, North American, including Canada. Canada's an important player in this, um, as well as a couple from China, but uh, the rest of the world is mostly missing in this discussion. Uh, and that's problematic. Um, and the same thing is true when we look at the way in which standards are being developed. Standards development, such as ISO, for instance, are international standard. However, if you look at who's actually actively participating in this, they are heavily dominated by the global north plus China, China being a strong mover in the recent years, pushing quite heavily. And we actually now find that um, the, the Western countries are very concerned about the way in which China is pushing its perspective, its particular ideas for standards in these communities. Uh, but we may, we could argue that that is exactly the kind of work that, that thing that um, Western Europe and, and North America have previously been doing. But we see, uh, uh, you know, Global South is generally speaking, not really at the table when it comes to developing these standards. Also very much um, the standards of development is heavily dominated by industry players. Uh, they have vested interests. They want these standards because they are going to be the ones using these standards. But what that means is if they are the only ones at the table, um, concerns from civil society will not be, um, will, will not be discussed, um, will not be included uh, in the way in which the standards are being developed. And also the people at the table are primarily men, um, which basically comes from the fact that most of them are industry people uh, and in that industry uh, is heavily male dominated. Um, and that is my presentation. I'm now open for questions. Thank you, Ansgar. It was a completely new topic on this. And uh, thank you for presenting this topic at this conference.